He's a uh, He's in school summertime, and he's he's got a his his band is is expanding and growing, and going to be doing more recording. So one day, James, don't forget us when you're big, all right? And uh, remember remember the, us, and uh, you you all can one day say, "Hey, I knew that guy. I, I knew him when he when he strikes it big." So uh, we're we're just we're happy for you, James, and we pray for you and thank you for uh, your service. Um, so we are. Uh, in in a series here and and I don't know if you guys notice it or not but um, the world's a pretty crazy place yes? yes the world's a pretty crazy place you only have to turn on the news for a few minutes uh, to kind of recognize that uh, and, and it's not just local you know it's all around the world uh, the devastation in Nepal if you've been following that just tragic and and, and terrible over 8,000 people have lost their lives in the two earthquakes that have happened very close together in the last month. And 600,000 families have lost their homes. Can you imagine? I mean, 600,000 families today are without homes because of the devastation there. And, and, and it's tragic. Uh, the growing threat of ISIS around the world and persecution of Christians and churches and just a deliberate and systematic hunting down and burning of churches and devastation to Christian families around the world continues to be a threat and a growing threat um, if, you, if you're following. In, in our communities around America, there is intense racial struggle and, and, and turmoil and, 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 and uh, unrest. And it's, a, it's, it's being publicly displayed for us from pains and hurts that stem a long time and from things that are just are, are, are hard for us at times to comprehend or understand, but uh, lots of turmoil, lots of unrest, lots of distrust in our communities around the country. Divorce rate continues to skyrocket, continues to grow, both within and without the church. And, and if you're married, I want to encourage you and challenge you and exhort you to be here tonight for the introduction to this marriage class that is happening here for um, that Jeremy and Cindy are going to lead. You'll be blessed by it. You'll be challenged by it. You'll be changed by it. And, and we need that. If there's ever a time in our society where we need marriages to stand up and become the kind of marriages that God calls us to be, it's today. Amen? Amen. And, and, and we need help in doing that. And so you'll get help tonight. Uh, so I hope you'll come. Addiction. One in four people suffer from addiction. One in four from some sort of addiction. And you're here today. Some of you are in this room today and you're dealing with an addictive uh, compulsion or an issue. If, if you're not, you know someone who is and your family is suffering for it and hurting through it. Uh, I read just this recently that the Tennessee Suicide Prevention uh, just released a statistic that one in 11 of our young people, not adults, young people, attempt to commit suicide every year. This year, one in 11. That's, that is unbelievable. One in 11 of our young people attempted suicide. That means, that, and that could be here in this room, and if not here in this room, you know someone who this past year has thought of suicide or attempted it. One in 11. If there's ever a time for us to invest in our youth and our young people and to model for them what it looks like to follow Jesus, it's today. Amen? Amen. There's a hunger and a cry there that we have to address and meet. Just yesterday I read a news article uh, that Fairfax County in Virginia, the school system has voted to uh, teach gender fluidity within their school system. You, yeah, you're looking at me like, like, what? Yes, gender fluidity. In other words, um, give the children in 7th to 12th grades these options of what it means to be a boy or a girl and allow them to choose where they fit on that spectrum. They call it gender fluidity. We're not going to impose on you that you're a boy or a girl. It would appear, looking at all of this stuff, that all of us are like running like mad from something. We're running away from something, and we're hiding something, we're scared of something. Our culture is struggling mightily, both vocationally, financially, 
We've got consumer debt in our nation is, is at an all-time high. Locationally, financially, emotionally, relationally, and spiritually. We are struggling as a culture in all of these areas. And you're here today, just because you're here today doesn't make you immune to those struggles. You know them. You experience them yourselves. They're in your marriage, they're in your home, in your family, among your kids. You're dealing with this. And recent studies show that the church is struggling too. Um, just recently, a, a new study called the Pew, uh, the Pew Research for PEW uh, Forum has come out with uh, new studies. There are, uh, there are some slides for you up here. Um, 250,000 Protestant churches in America. Of those 250,000, 200,000 of them are either stagnant or declining. 200,000 of 250 are either stagnant, which means they have not seen a new member or a new baptism, uh, a, a, any kind of growth at all, or they're declining, they're losing people through just wash out. They're leaving. 3,500 churches every year across our nation close their doors. 3,500 churches close their doors each year. And we're not doing well to replace that because only 1,000 churches are planted each year. So every year you have 2,500 churches which are no longer in existence, no longer a light in their community, no longer uh, a, a place, a bastion of hope offering freedom in the gospel of Jesus Christ. 2,500 every year gone. The Pew research that was just done this week, if you saw it, uh, shows a staggering decline in adults who claim to be Christians. Since 2007, an 8% dip among adults in America who profess to be Christians. And not only is that dip happening of 8%, but likewise a 5% raise among adults who claim to be the nuns. The nuns is a new word that's been developed for people who say, I have no religious affiliation, I don't believe in this, I don't believe in that, and I don't belong to a church, I'm just none. So an 8% dip and a 5% rise in just the last seven years. Staggering. Staggering. I believe that God has a mighty, mighty work for us as a church to accomplish, and every church not just us, every church, that God has a mighty work for us to accomplish. And it is going to take a very intentional, a very deliberate, and an almost irrational commitment to the idea that the church is God's hope for the world. An almost irrational commitment to the idea that the church is God's hope to reach the lost in our world, to reach those who are, are caught in the midst of all of this struggle and this cultural pain that we're in. And, and so we've begun this series in Acts. In Acts, uh, the book of Acts, it, it follows the Gospels. You've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then the book of Acts. It's written by Luke, a disciple of Jesus, who wrote the book of Luke. He also wrote Luke, yes. Luke wrote Luke, okay? And, and he also, part two of his book was Acts, which is what happens after Jesus ascended and how the church became the church. And, and what that looked like. And Luke reports all of this for us. We started last week in Acts chapter 1 where Jesus ascended. And, and essentially, if you'll remember, Jesus said, Look, I know there's some issues going on here. I know you all don't have it yet. But you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Jesus trusted the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon his people and those who claimed to follow him. And that that would change everything for them. Everything would change. And, and we have to, I think we need to be aware though, I, I named all of these uh, struggles that are happening in our culture today. The church that was planted and birthed in Acts was dealing with much the same thing. Okay? We, that's important for you to know. The church that was birthed in Acts 2,000 years ago was not birthed in a, in, a, in a beautiful, pristine, cultural environment where everything was just fine. They had religious persecution. They, they, they could not worship freely like we do today. They had, uh, there was uh, prostitution on the streets and in the temples. There was all kinds of, of, of crime and disease. If you lived to be 30, you were doing really well. Who's over 30 here? Raise your hand. Come on. 
Yeah. yeah. Most likely, you would not have lived back when the church was planted beyond that age. I mean, disease and plague. I mean, there was just so much. And so they had their own struggles. They had their own struggles. And, and in the midst of all of this, the church was born. And it thrived. It grew. It spread like wildfire throughout the world. Why? Well, we know that the church often does thrive where there is struggle, where there is, 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 is pain. You see that in China. There are more Christians every day in China than there are in America. So what I want us to do is I want us to look at what, what this early church, what was significant about this church that made it what it was. And we're calling this title, the series, Unleashed. What is it about them that was unleashed into the world? And what can we do as the people of God to be unleashed into our world, the world that we find ourselves in, uh, that is, is hurting and struggling and in a lot of pain? What do we need to do? So let, let's look. If you have your Bibles, open to chapter 2 in Acts. And we're going to be uh, picking up here in verse 14. And the words should be on the screen behind me as well if you want to follow there. Here we have Peter. Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles. Now, now what's significant here about Peter is if you know anything about Peter, just a few weeks before this story happens right here, Peter was denying that Jesus was even his buddy. Peter, while Jesus was about to go to the cross and be executed, three times looked at someone and said, I don't know that guy. No, I don't, I don't have anything to do with it. Peter denied that he even had anything to do with Jesus. And here we find him, after the Holy Spirit comes upon Peter, jumping out and shouting to the crowd, Hey, I know Jesus. And Jesus wants to know you. Something happened to Peter, amen? And what happened to Peter can happen to every single one of us. God wants it to happen to every single one of us. The Holy Spirit got a hold of his life. He allowed him to enter. So Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, Listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem, make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. In other words, hey, you see something is crazy going on here with these folks. They're not drunk. It's too early for that. We'll get to that later. But something obviously has happened that has made you guys look upon us and go, you guys are weird. You guys aren't right. Something strange about you. No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. It's Acts 2, 14 to 17. Your young men will see visions. Your sons and daughters are going to prophesy. They're going to see the word of God, and they're going to see it come forward, and they're going to call forth you guys to do something big. Your old men will dream dreams. A spirit-filled people are a visionary people. If you're following along in your notes you have in there, you might want to write that down. Spirit-filled people are visionary. They're visionary. Followers of Jesus have a bigger purpose in their life than just getting through today. Amen. Now, I, 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 I know that there are many of us in here today who, for right now, just getting through today is a pretty good goal. Amen? And you know someone, maybe, who just getting through today would be a pretty good goal. We say it in recovery all the time, one day at a time. One day at a time. One day at a time. And, 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 and by God's grace, you'll get through today. We're going to talk in a moment about how you can maybe do that uh, in, in a way that's honoring to God, in a way that will get you from a place. But that's not what all God... God doesn't want you to just be one day at a time. God doesn't want us to just be, hey, I just need to get through today. God wants us to see a bigger picture. He wants us to see, to see His future. He wants us to see what He's dreaming about. What does God want? What does He want? He wants us to be visionary. 
like he is. So what are the, some of the things uh, God wants to see done? Well, it's not you don't have to go very far to look. In 1 Timothy 2.4, God it says God wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. That's a pretty good vision, isn't it? God's vision is to see everyone saved and to come to know the truth. To come into an understanding of who God is. To come into walking with and along with His Spirit. That's a pretty good vision. If you need a vision, adopt God's vision. If you need a vision for your life today that's bigger than just getting through today, start thinking about, God, give me your heart. Pray, God, give me, give me your heart that breaks for the lost around us. Give me your heart that wants to see others around me come to know you and to know the truth. Peter, uh, in his sermon in chapter 2 here, will, will go on to say, it'll come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's a good vision. It's why, it's why we write these names up on the boards behind me here. It's to keep the vision in front of us that there are other people besides us who need Jesus. There are other people who need to hear the good news. There are other people who are hurting and struggling. And, and God, give us a heart that breaks for them. Make us become the kind of people that want the people nobody else wants. We started praying that about a year and a half ago. You remember that, church? Some of you were here for that. God, give us the kind of heart that wants the kind of people that nobody else wants. Send them here to Mountain View. We'll love them. We'll point them to Jesus. We'll feed them. We'll give them, we'll, we'll house them. We'll find jobs for them. We'll help them move from this place of being in the rut and in the gutter and, and show them something bigger. We'll, we'll, we'll be a people who can be bigger visionaries than just getting through today and just looking out for me, myself, and I. Amen? Amen. That's what God wants to see. The people of God, the Spirit-filled people of God have vision that is bigger than ourselves. How do we do that? How do we get to a place of vision? Well, let's look at what they did. Verse 42. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe, reverence, came over them all. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. Things got done. Things got done when they devoted themselves to these things. And all the believers met together in one place, and they shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshipped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. Number two thing that we can take away from this is spirit-filled people are devoted. Spirit-filled people, they're visionary and they're devoted. They're devoted. Well, devoted to what? Well, they devotedly, they daily devoted themselves to the things of God. They devoted themselves to the teaching. They devoted themselves to the, the worship and prayer and small groups and giving. You see that here in the text. They went to a temple to worship together and to learn something, and then they, they worked it out in their homes. You see that? You see how they did this? They, they went to the temple for teaching, and then they worked it out in their homes. Get the teaching in the temple, work it out in the home. Get the teaching in the temple, work it out in the home. Get the teaching on Sunday at church, work it out in your home, amongst other believers and the, the idea of small groups that, that we've begun here as an initiative in 2015 is right here in 33 AD in Acts. The idea of getting together in your home, eating together, sharing life together, wrestling with what you're learning, wrestling with what you're going on in your life, being open with each other. We do this... In, on Thursday nights in our open share groups. We do this on Sunday nights in our small groups. But we're not done yet. We're not there yet. We just begun in 2015 to really make this a, a push for us. And, and if you're a member of Mountain View Church, we want to see you become 
involved and engaged in some sort of a small group. So, well, Thursday nights don't work for me, Sunday nights don't work for me, I'm busy. Okay, start a group in your house. Start this week. Get together and talk about the teaching that you received on Sunday and get three or four people together in your home and say, hey, come on over, we'll have some salsa and chips and, uh, um, and we'll talk it out and we'll pray together. Get together. Spirit-filled people are devoted to the things of God and moving in a way that doesn't. I, Leonard mentioned uh, uh, cancer. I want you all to put on, I want you to put your imagination cap on and imagine you're a doctor. Okay? Not just any doctor, you're an oncologist. You're a cancer doctor. Alright? You all got that? Every day around you, you see, you see death. You see, you see life being strangled by cancer. And you see, you see uh, dreams being shot, and lives being destroyed, and families being broken apart through cancer. Yes? You see this. All right, I'm your patient. Sorry. I'm your patient. I come to you, and, and it's been discovered that I've got cancer. And you come to me as my doctor and you say, Chad, I've got bad news for you. You, you. you have cancer and it's spreading. The good news is, though, we've caught it in enough time where we can put a stop to it. And we can halt its growth. In fact, we might even be able to help uh, make it go into remission and maybe even eradicate it from the body. We've caught it in enough time. And I say, thank you. That's good news. And then you, as my doctor, say, okay, but here, I say, what do I need to do? And you, you doctor, you say, okay, Chad, I, I need you to get on this regimen of, 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 of medicines. Um, and for the next several weeks, you're going to have to come here every day. And we're going to have to do some tests on you. We're going to have to uh, pump you full of this stuff. You're going to have to uh, change your diet. You're going to have to uh, change uh, maybe your work schedule so that you can be able to come to make all your doctor's appointments. You're going to have to be able. To, you're going to have to alter your life in such a way so that we can administer to you the medicines that you're going to need to save your life. And I, your patient, says, um, "That's too much. I, I, I've only got an hour a week." Can you fit all of that into an hour a week? What would you say to me as your patient? <laughs> yeah. you, 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 you would rightfully think that I was crazy, and you would rightfully say, Chad, if you continue down this track, you're going to die. An hour a week will not cut off the cancer in your life. An hour a week will not change your life. An hour a week will not make a bit of difference in your life. The cancer will continue to grow, it will continue to spread, and within a few years, you'll be dead. Amen? Amen? And yet, we have churches full of people who come to church an hour a week, and they expect that this is somehow going to save them from the cancer of sin in their lives, the culture that is moving in at rapid speed, causing disease and devastation and just chaos, and we think that that's going to change our minds and renew our hearts and change us from the inside out. I come an hour a week to church. No. Spirit-filled people know that they are desperately in need to be devoted to the things of God. What are those things? The teaching, the fellowship, small groups, being around praying people, being in the Word, giving. Those are must-dos. They're not negotiable. They're, they're not well off. I mean, if, if you're a cancer doctor and the patient comes in and goes, well, okay, yeah, I see I need all this stuff, but let me take a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and a little bit of this. Dead. That's the, that's the prognosis for someone who treats cancer that way. Amen? And the prognosis for us, friends, who are part of a church, who want to just sort of 
go through the buffet line and pick and choose what works for you on your time schedule and what I'll fit God in when it's convenient for me. The prognosis, death. You won't make it. You will not make it when, when the tides of life come crashing in and when the earthquake strikes and just uproots everything in your life, you will not have the ability to withstand the storm. And Jesus wants so much more for you and I than that. He wants, if you want to feel connected, if you want to be connected to your church, get involved in a small group. You're not going to find that necessarily on a Sunday morning, and you shouldn't expect to find it on a Sunday morning. This is for us to come together, to get teaching, to worship God, to be recharged and filled so that we can go out and work it out Monday through Saturday in our homes. Amen? Amen. If you're looking for one hour on Sunday morning to do for you everything that you think ought to be done for you, you've got the wrong idea of what church is. You need to flip it upside down. This is a time where we come together and give praise to what you've been learning about all week. This is a time where we come and rejoice and say, hey, I, 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 on, on Tuesday night in my small group, man, God just, I, 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 God just revealed something to me that was just powerful. And here I am on Sunday morning to just give him praise and rejoice and to, and, and to just learn something more that now I can go back out in this week and learn and, and put it to practice. That's what we ought to be doing here. You're not going to know everyone here on Sunday morning. You're just not. You can in your small groups. And that's where it's supposed to be. That's, that's, that's the biblical model for us. And we shouldn't mess that up. And why won't you know everyone? Well, because if we're doing all of that, if we are devoted, we've got to move on. The last part is... A spirit-filled people, they're contagious. Spirit-filled people, they're contagious. You're going to become contagious. If you are devoting yourselves to those things which the early church devoted themselves to, then, then growth and multiplying will become a natural byproduct of who we are as a church. So naturally, you won't know everyone on Sunday because you'll be bringing a friend that other people don't know on Sunday. Amen? You, you'll be bringing people, people will be coming, they'll be saying, what's going on in your life? I once knew you as this, and now I see you as this. I once knew you as homeless, now I see you moving forward, and, and uh, you've got a life together. I once saw you as an addict, and you were strung out on drugs, and now I see you sober, and, and giving, and, and, and pouring into other people. What's going on in your life? God wants to do that. He wants to make us contagious. This was built into the very fabric in the beginning of creation in Genesis 1.28. God blessed them, Adam and Eve. And he said to them, hey, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Now, there, there's one form of multiplication there, right, uh, that God is talking about. Physical multiplication. But there, there is another, you know, some of us are beyond... You know, I've got five kids, and if I have another child, it will have to be by immaculate conception, okay? Or adopt, or more adoption. And I'm not going to say I'm not open to that, because I know what happens when I say, God, no more kids. All right? Lord. <laughs> but, <laughs> so, but, but who are you pouring into? Just because I can't have any more biological children doesn't mean I shouldn't be multiplying. Who are you pouring into? What's one person this year you're pouring your life into that are going to replicate? And you become two, and two become four, and four become eight. Who are you pouring your life into? Spirit-filled people are contagious, and, and they're doing that. But look throughout, throughout the book of Acts, there's other examples of this. Look, Acts chapter 6. The word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly. Acts 9. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up, and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it continued to what? Increase. increase. Acts chapter 12. But the Lord, word of the Lord continued to grow and to be what? Multiplied. Multiplied. Contagion, 
multiplicity, growth, that's a natural byproduct of being filled with the Spirit of God. It says something, doesn't it, when you look at 250,000 churches in America and 200,000 of them are stagnant or dying. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy on us. We've, gotten, we've lost sight of, of, of the vision that God has for us as a church, and we've lost sight of, of, of the devotion that we're supposed to have to certain things. We've become devoted to ourselves rather than devoted to the things that God wants us to be devoted to, and therefore the Spirit is not able to work in and through us, and therefore we're not contagious. Why should it? I mean, it, you look at the state of the church in most places, and you say, no, no wonder 8% drop in people who call themselves Christians. No wonder a 5% rise in people who say, I don't want anything to do with that. Lord have mercy. So the question I want to ask you as, as you think about this is, have more people caught Jesus from you than have caught the common cold? <laughs> think about that. Have more people caught Jesus from you because you're, you're a spirit-filled Christian and, and you're devoting yourself to the things of God. Have more people <sighs> caught Jesus from you than have caught the common cold? Now, some of you are sick a lot, so you spread colds a lot. But God wants us to be contagious with the Spirit of Jesus Christ. God wants us to be a, a, a movement, a radical movement of His presence in this community. We've got opportunity, friends, abounding all around us. We live in a time and a period of a place where there is unprecedented, unprecedented opportunities for us to be the church of Jesus Christ and to be unleashed. And just there, there's some areas in which I really need people to step up and serve and to become a part of, of a movement here. There in your in the in the folders in your each of your pews, there is a, a little sheet. I want to encourage you to grab that. It says, what's your next step? Every one of us has a next step. Your next step might be today. Maybe today you said, you know what? I, I, haven't, I haven't been walking with Jesus. In fact, I've been kind of walking uh, away from him. And, but I know that that's leading me to death. And I, I, I want to put a stop to the cancer that is in my life and, and the cancer that is, is, is happening. I, 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 want to, I want to say no to that and I want to say yes to the giver of life today. And maybe your step today is to say, I want to become a follower of Jesus. Maybe your step is to say, I, I want to be baptized. I've never been baptized before. I want to get baptized. I want to follow Jesus in baptism. Next Sunday, we're going to have a baptism party here. We're going to have a pool outside here. We're going to have a potluck dinner. Uh, bring, bring a dish to share. And, and if you want to be baptized on that sheet, mark your name. Check that off and leave it with us today. Or call me and we'll talk this week. Maybe, maybe your next step is to get plugged into a small group. You, you, you've been doing the hour a week thing for a long, long time. And it's time now to share life with other believers. And you're going to have to make some time for it. You're going to have to adjust your schedule. Maybe, maybe God's calling you to start one of those small groups. Come and talk to me. Say, hey, Chad, we'll, we'll open up um, my house on Tuesday evening, whatever it might be, or Saturday morning, or whatever. And... and and we'll get word out. There ought to be throughout the week, there ought to be several groups that you all are plugging into, that you have an opportunity to plug into and do life with and to learn and grow with. Devote yourself to that. Praying together. You all learned the 938 prayer last week. You've been praying it? Your alarm goes off at 938 on your phone and we pray, Lord, send us the laborers and the people we need to bring in the harvest from Matthew 938. Set your alarm clock on your phone at 9.38. Join us as a church praying that every day. 
Join us on Sunday morning at 940 as we did this morning and pray. We'll pray. We pray here every Sunday morning at 940. Join us. To pray for the names on these walls and for our, our, our services. On Tuesday the 26th, there's an opportunity for you to serve. Uh, we're going to have a meeting here at Mountain View. We're calling up together leaders in the community to talk about the homelessness situation in our county and, and how we need a halfway house, a place where people can come when they're at the bottom and, and be shown how they can move and rise to a, a place where they can become um, productive members of the community once again and, and, and active in a church. So we need a lunch that we're providing. If you want to, Vicki, would you raise your hand, please? See Vicki. If you want to provide something to eat for those who are coming to that meeting, see Vicki. If you want to come and sit in on the meeting and learn more, come Tuesday at noon here in the fellowship hall. Recovery ministry, every Thursday night, there are opportunities for you to serve. Opportunities for you to serve through uh, food or greeting people, praying for people, just being here and being a friendly face. Come. There are. We can set the table, but you have to come and eat. Amen? We can set the table, but you have to come and eat. And if you're noticing a disconnect, if you're noticing a disconnect as James and Colin come and they lead us in our closing song, Jesus is here today to fill that need. He's here saying, hey, I, I, have the, I have the recipe to stop the cancer that's growing in your life. I have the recipe to not only stop it, but to eradicate it from your life. If you would but just repent and turn again. It's one of my greatest verses, my promise. I think it's, it's here in the next slide there, guys. Acts 3. Repent and turn again. This, the word repent there, it means to say, God, I take my way of thinking about how things ought to be done, and I want to replace it with your way of thinking about life. Your way of thinking about how to do life. Your, your way of doing life. And, and I change my, I, I lay down my stuff, and, and would you, but I love that word again. Isn't that one, that's one of, probably one of the most beautiful, graceful words in all of scripture. Again. Because friends, the truth is we'll have to do that daily. God, I live in a world saturated with cancer and pain and sin, sickness. I need you to change me from the inside out. Friends, if you want to do that today, he's willing to say, hey, yes, I'm here. And let his refreshing come and flood your heart today. Would you please stand? We're going to sing our closing song. Jesus is here in this place. He wants to refresh your soul today. Come and spend some time with him this morning. He loves you. In his sweet name. Amen.